doesn't like petty texts, celebrity gossip, dating advice, spicy song lyrics, or just controversial opinions in general. Now imagine all that, but it's historical. In this podcast, we'll be reading some juicy historical letters, diaries, articles, and other piping hot tea. So get yourself something to drink and let's jump into textury. Hi guys, today let's jump into 1840s Poland and let's see what life was like for a normal but very dramatic teenage girl. I'm going to try and be fast with giving you some historical context here. It's gonna be difficult because as you will see later or hear later, politics were intertwined in almost every aspect of a person's life at a time and obviously people at the time were very concerned, even if the person we're talking about was just 18 or 19 at the time. So today we're reading the diary of Selina Dominikowska, who was a Polish artist and writer. Now, not to diminish her achievements, but just so you know, in terms of Polish historical figures, I would say she's like a B-list celebrity, like she's not anyone famous or taught about in schools. And I only found out about her because I stumbled upon another one of her diaries. So this is just to give you context as to who she was. Um, she has a Wikipedia page, but she's not famous. <laughs> she was from a family of gentry. Her family owned a village called Wonie, which is in modern day Ukraine near Lvov, which I'm gonna say in Polish because that's the way she wrote about it in, um, in her diaries, but basically Lviv. What was the situation like in the 1840s? Well, it was, it was pretty grim, not gonna lie. Poland was partitioned at the time, so it was separated into three different sections that were occupied by Prussians, Russians and Austrians. Uh, Celina was living in the Austrian part of the country, which was also the poorest and it was the poorest province in the Austrian Empire, so it was pretty bad. In 1830 there was the November Uprising, which attempted regaining independence and it failed miserably. In 1846 there was the Kraków Uprising and the fighters were kind of hoping to motivate the peasants to fight as well and they promised them to partially abolish serfdom and they promised them all sorts of benefits, but something completely else happened. Um, the Austrians knew what was cooking up and they encouraged the peasants to kill their masters and that resulted in the Galician slaughter, where peasants would attack local manors and slaughter the nobles, basically. They would just straight up kill mostly male, male nobles, but um, they didn't discriminate. And in the Tarnów region, which is approximately an hour away from where I was born, about 90% of the manor houses was destroyed. So the Austrian administration paid for each head of the noble that was delivered to them. And this was very effective and successful in suppressing the uprising. Now it's kind of ironic because the nobles that were behind the uprising were actually very dedicated to the serfs situation and were even praised by Karl Marx himself. So it was a whole mess. It's very likely that Selina has lost some family members or acquaintances to the slaughter. I didn't do research deep enough to find out, but even if she didn't, she must have heard about what happened and given that she herself would have been considered a noble at, at the time and would have been affected if she lived in that area, it definitely affected her in a lot of ways, which you will see shortly. And to top it off, <laughs> two years later, the whole of Europe erupted during the Springtime of Nations. Springtime of Nations was a revolutionary movement that resulted in a lot of political and social changes across the nations that were living in Europe at the time. Some nations gained independence, some gained more rights. It is evident that Selina hoped for the same outcome for Poland, or at least the area that she was living in. But unfortunately, as we know now, it did not happen and it didn't happen until after First World War. And unfortunately, Celina did not live to see independent Poland because she died, I think, in 1908 
and Poland gained independence in 1918. So that's pretty sad. <laughs> and this is all that happened in the years and uh, the months before this diary was written. I will read some of my favorite excerpts from the diary and don't be discouraged by the number of Polish names you don't know because I don't know them either. The Polish surnames mean nothing to me, it's just like random strangers. And the names of the places are probably located in Ukraine right now, so they also don't sound familiar to me at all. Most of the names are of her acquaintances and family members from the gentry. And also, by the way, I did the translation myself, so sorry if it's a little wobbly sometimes, but translating from 19th century Polish is no easy feat, and I actually had to even crack a code at some point, so, so bear with me. Basically, this girl was going through it, like she was stuck in the countryside manor with not much to do, and she led a pretty lonely life. And I think this is something that was the core of her many issues, just like not having friends, and even when she did have friends, she wasn't sure if she likes the friends, which you will also see. There was a lot happening and I have uh, parts of the diary that I picked to show you different things that were happening to her at the time. So according to my math, she was like 18 or 19 at that time. I, I am bad at math, so I can't tell you precisely, but she was, she was a teenager still. The first entry is pretty depressing, not gonna lie. It gets better, I promise, but she must have been going through it at that point because it's 20th October, 1848, and my guess is maybe just the weather got to her, maybe she was suffering from like a mild seasonal depression because this is what she wrote. It's quiet and gloomy around me, the sky is crying and life is not much happier. Those autumn days and the happenings of the world do not bring us happiness. Dear God, why do we always long for happiness out of this world? Why do we always want what is impossible to achieve? Today the world seems so colorless, as if the sun was never to shine again, as if the days were to always pass in a sad and gloomy way. And I'm not even longing for a change, I'm not asking for entertainment, in fact, I'm angry when someone breaks my routine. I live without the thrills of young age. More and more leaves fall of the picturesque flowers of youth, and I would love nothing more than to be useful in the way I live life. And my only wish is that I have enough energy and resilience to finish what I started. And it gives me so much sorrow that by the end of the day, I cannot say I've done something useful for others. That I live only for myself. That even though I don't do any harm, I don't do any good either. My excuse is that there isn't enough opportunity. I would gladly sacrifice everything if there was an opportune moment. So little I pay consequence to this life. So little this world has charmed to me. That were it of any benefit to someone, I would gladly leave it. Because when I take a glance into the future, into this chaos of storm in Europe, when I imagine the countless battles we will have to go through, when so many thousands of victims and tragedies come to mind, my heart gets restless. No spark of hope shines in this labyrinth of defeats, and my spirit lowers terrified of the future. Living as a woman these days is double painful. Without active participation, she is but a passive member of society, while she feels all of its changes. And is it worth to feel sorry about this plant-like life? How I would love to move between the virgin woods of the new world, or to an unfriendly wild area where it's always spring, where the sky is not crying, and the world is not rumbling with a threatening storm. But is it possible? There is no such happiness in the world, and for me in particular there is none. None. I, I told you she was going through it. She hates the weather, she hates her life, everything's bad, politically it's a mess, she's stressed out about the politics. It all sounds so modern. Some of it sounds pretty dark. If that was of any benefit to someone, I would gladly leave this world. Like, girl, you need therapy, but... I think it only sounds really bad because you haven't read the other entries yet, but the more you read it, the more it's obvious that it was like a moment for her. It's 20th of October, she wrote this, and then 27th, she was already okay. 
If anything, it only makes me think of my diaries that I wrote at 19 when everything felt so much bigger than it actually was. And, and again, I think nothing has changed. I find this part very interesting where she says that women without active participation are a passive member of society while feeling all of its changes. And I feel like it's so interesting because imagine living in a society that you were part of and you had like no input whatsoever because you weren't even a working woman. So you were just stuck in your manner doing nothing. And then you could feel the world and and your country and the nation and society like moving on while you were stuck in the same place. So that must have been a really weird feeling. And also I love how she romanticizes about moving to the US, <laughs> the virgin woods of the new world, because the weather is better and there is no battles. Again, a very modern thought, Europeans and especially Polish people or Eastern Europeans romanticizing about moving to the US because it's sunny. <laughs> the next entry is from a week later and I find it so funny because it's all of it is shit talking her friends and people that she knows. 27th October, Friday. Today we're going to Ostrovczyk and from there maybe to my dear Albinka. It's the second person I love unlike many. She and Anielka are my friends, at least on my part, because I don't know if they love me the same. And I believe it's like a curse that I'm never loved back. Is it because I long for it? Is there no sympathy of the souls? I'm quite certain they don't love me as much as I do them. That in fact Albina does not know me enough yet. And it is my hope that once she knows my character better she will love me more and our friendship will be more firm. To have a friend with a heart and education, is there anything else I need in the world? There is a lot of ladies who I quite like because they're either pleasant or have a good heart, but there isn't a lot that draws me to them and that makes me wish for being loved back like I do with Anielka and Albinka. I like Julka Żarska, but she's a poor girl with a broken heart and a wobbly soul. She has not a single ounce of resilience and energy so needed in the times we live in and her letters are very spare too. All in all, she's nowhere close to my ideal of a woman. Wanda Raczyńska, as much as I know her, has more self-confidence, but also not enough resilience. And even though she's educated, I'm sometimes taken aback by her city manners. She's too bold when talking to the gentleman and too often complains about her circumstances. No, she could not be my friend. Now, here is a list of all the people she knows. Helena Żewuska, Otylia Malinowska, Julia Kamińska, Olesia Micewska, Sabina Czermińska, Malwina and Olesia Szczepańskie, Stasia and Klemunia Czerwińskie, and finally Aniela Matczyńska, those are not even worth a mention. Maybe apart from Klemunia Czerwińska, who has a lot of values I admire, but she's very ugly, therefore I could not love her. <laughs> Celina, Celina was a savage, for real. The other ones are either stupid, fake, soft or changing with every blow of the wind and their characters are so different from mine I do not long for their love. They're indifferent to me because to love someone I have to value and respect them and it's not my fault they don't deserve it. <laughs> Let me finish off now that I've written my sympathies and antipathies because we are headed out now even though it's raining a little. This is hilarious because not only did she diss these people so much, but also all of the tea, like Clemonia Czerwińska, who has a lot of values I admire, but she's very ugly. Girl, you didn't have to do her like this. Now all that we know about Clemonia Czerwińska was that she was ugly. The other ones are stupid, fake, soft or changing. She had a lot of beef with girls her age, judging by the diaries. She had a lot of issues with fake ass <laughs> because every now and then she's like, I don't know if she's actually my friend. I think she kind of doesn't like me. And at first I was like, maybe that, that was her issue. Maybe she was just unsure of people's feelings towards her. But there is one story that I will read later that kind of proves her point. <laughs> Stepping away from the funny bits now is like a dramatic part where in November 1848 there were some there was some fighting going on in her area. 
3rd November. What shall I write? I'm all hazy. Lvov is being bombarded. There is an uprising, but how did it end? That I do not know. We'll write when we find out something. Yesterday at 11, I was sitting in the gazebo and I was waiting for Mrs. Potakowska, who was leaving for Lvov to say my goodbyes. It was a splendid time. I was reading a book, but I could hear cannons every now and then. I thought maybe it was some parade and I paid it no mind. After saying my goodbyes to Potakowska, I kept hearing the cannons. And around one, I went back to my room and not mentioning anything, I forgot the whole thing. How big was our surprise when around five, we saw Potakowska returning from Kurovica, where she was told no one is let into Lvov since eight in the morning, that there are fights, barricades, furniture thrown out of windows, and she herself saw ominous black smoke billowing through the valleys. She came back, her husband took his stagecoat that night, and we're in such uncertainty, dear God, what is happening there? They're afraid of a carnage. Have ours succeeded, perhaps, or they want to initiate an uprising in the countryside, but nothing is certain, oh God. It's awful to live in fear, not for one's life, because it has little charms to me, and I don't believe in repeating of the Tarnov scenes yet, but for our freedom, for the lives of youth that wants to sacrifice themselves, that does not spare its blood, its arms. Oh, the ruler of the world, you are just. Will you let the enemies win? If the uprising was a consequence of the Vienna win, if the good cause won there as well, Oh, how much more free it would be to breathe. And if only an accident caused this fight, as we've been told, and Vienna is surrendering, then it would be better not to experience this little constitutional freedom, better to always be enslaved, than to return to the heavy shackles and forget the hard-earned freedoms paid for by the martyr's blood. This is all I shall write, because I am like in fever, and we're supposed to go to Słowiła. So, all sorts of drama here. She is mentioning the carnage that I talked about. They're afraid of a carnage because of what happened in 1946 in Tarnów. She's referring to Tarnów as well. She's like, I don't believe in repeating of the Tarnów scenes yet. So, like, she doesn't believe it's possible that the local peasants will rise up against them and basically murder them. She is hoping for a change, but also she knows that if whatever they're fighting for is unsuccessful, there will be consequences and things will get even worse. And that was the case with most of the Polish uprisings. They knew that whatever they're fighting for, if they don't succeed, the consequences will be even worse than what was before the uprising. So uh, I guess that's what she's worried about here. And that's what she's referring to as like returning to heavy shackles after the hard-earned freedoms. Once they got some laws that were beneficial to them, they could lose those laws by, by revolting, basically. This episode is sponsored by Incogni. Incogni is a service that helps internet users fight their personal information and data being used by data brokers. So basically, data breaches across the world are on the rise. Since 2021, the number of data breach and identity theft of victims went up over 40%. Your personal information, like your address, your phone number, your email, even your shopping habits, all this is being sold online and you might not even know about it. And even if you do personally contact the data brokers to remove your information, they can still continue collecting it after they have removed it. So it's a little pointless. That's where Incogni comes in. Incogni contacts the brokers on your behalf to request the removal of your personal data and it does so repeatedly. So whenever a new record will pop up on one of those sites, Incogni will automatically pursue them to remove it. So if that sounds like a service that you need, use the link in the description of this episode to get Incogni right now. Anyway, back to the episode.
her next entry is from 19th of November, is Sunday. So that's a while because the previous entry was 3rd of November. And it basically describes a peaceful lifestyle that they led in, in the manor. I just read what I wrote last time. Now I am so different. I do not wish to remember any of those feelings and events because it all ended too badly. I would have to elaborate too much with wrath and hatred towards the enemies. So I will keep quiet and describe our current quiet life instead. Brothers are here since two weeks. There is nothing to do in Lvov. So time is spent as freely and as joyfully as possible. At first, after finding out about Lost Hopes and Vienna's capitulation, she's referring to the Spring of the Nations here, it was painful to say goodbye to the vision of the better days. But after consideration, we do not lose hope because it cannot last too long and things will have to be good. And our star of hope may be hidden in the clouds, but shall re-emerge and shine even brighter. Life now is so joyful and I feel so happy, things I never expected this sad autumn, but experience makes a man. I know that people waste their lives wishing unlimited entertainments, but should I wish for something that will never be? I am content with the happiness that the fate gave me and I am happy, never bored, because I am used to solitude and work. I write during the days, read, play the instruments and sing, in the evening, we teach peasant children who are delighting us with their progress and goodwill. And when the candles are lit, we play whist with the family because I see Potakovsky as our family now as they visit every second day. And parents love spending time this way and their eyes are not spoiled by reading. A friendly reminder that electricity did not exist yet. And nobody visits us and we don't go anywhere because the roads are very bad, but we're happy with that and we wish we could spend life as long as possible this way, with little profit to others. And the brothers are happy, Hilarcio paints with Lunia and Hans, while Kostus reads and converses with us, plays his flute and gets into political talk. All we are missing are the papers, but this we shall have soon. And maybe for some time we will live so peacefully and nice. I'm not afraid of the carnage. I don't know why, but I am quite peaceful. I still believe in the uneducated but vengeful peasants. I don't get this fear and I hope dearly that this happy illusion does not collapse over the years like some others. A little later on 2nd of January 1849, she celebrated her name day. I don't know if it's a thing in other countries. In Poland, name days used to be a bigger thing than birthdays even. For some people, we, we still celebrate them. I feel like my generation is sort of where it starts fading out, but we used to, at least. So she writes, I really don't feel like writing because I'm very cold at this desk. My fingers are grubby and I will have to play the piano. But I'm forcing myself to write because I don't know when else will I find the time to describe how I spent Christmas. I won't mention the few weeks before Christmas because they went by so peacefully and steadily as the day I described the last time. For my name day, we were invited to Zadvuz, and despite not feeling like it or maybe because of it, mom insisted and we left on a sledged carriage. But in our forest, the carriage fell, horses kept pulling us a little more downhill, we first screamed and I laughed and seeing nobody was hurt, we returned home since it was impossible to travel with a broken sledge. I thought we will not go at all after such an incident, but the following morning we left again. After a mile of going by the treacherous road next to Gliniane, we broke a wheel. It was just me and mom, and the others were not to be seen. We sent to the farm for a new wheel while waiting in the cold. At this point, mother wanted to return home. <laughs> Those circumstances amused me and made me laugh, same girl. I waited patiently to see what is decided. Finally, they delivered both the sledges and a carriage. Hilare put mom on the sledges, almost against her will. Hilare is her brother. And we happily arrived in Zadvuz. My name day was quite joyful. We danced, drank wine and talked. The next day we played whist almost all day and the third day we had a great plan of going to Ostrov. 
all youth under the care of Miss Shedler. We got on the sledges and made it to the nearby manor. There was plenty of laughter and jokes, a lot of fun, and though they didn't want to let us go, we gave our word to our mothers and so we returned to Zadvuz at night using torchlight and having drunk a couple of glasses of champagne. We were at my aunt's for another day and we visited Mrs. Winnitska in Lisek. There were dances, there was clever and funny talk. Miss Celina and Miss Antonina were pleasant and Mr. Titus was very pleasant. Uh, when I read this, I was like, oh, very pleasant, you say, but then he's never mentioned, so I guess he wasn't that pleasant after all. He saw us to Zadvush and went to Gliniana with us and Felix the other day. Now, for the epiphany, we're expecting Honorka, Felix, Titus, Winnitsky, Albinka, Otilka with her parents and Helena with her father. Maybe we will have fun, but it's more likely we won't. <laughs> what the hell, girl? Why? Wh where is that attitude coming from? I am so indifferent to those entertainments now. I am so happy alone. The days when I shook with excitement at the very thought of entertainment are long gone. The times when I was headed to new parties with a loudly beating heart and was afraid of any inconvenience, any disappointment. Now, even if none of the supposed guests appeared, I could not care less. <laughs> I mean, mood. Uh, because I can do just fine with the company of my brothers and my students. I have a new student, Polusha, I'm teaching her the alphabet, and every time I almost run out of patience, I find it comforting to think I'm using my time well. So many parties that I'm not excited for at all. How peculiar the fate is. Two years ago, when I so desperately longed to live amongst people and wanted for nothing but parties and entertainment, I was stuck all alone in the country, seeing almost no one. Now when I am more indifferent, when I got to know people better and my youthful hopes have diminished, we are visiting more often and are receiving guests too. Why do our wishes never come true? <laughs> also mood. Um, Pay attention to Otilka and Helena mentioned here. She apparently really disliked Helena. Like she just mentioned a couple of times that Helena is unbearable. And Otilka is her, I don't know the timing here, but she will be her ex-friend soon. And I'm going to read you why. Anyway, here is like a very dramatic entry from 25th February. Is there truly no happiness on earth? Do the most respectable people have to suffer and destroy their souls and hearts, fighting the passions? How I long for the carefree moments when I was 16. Girl, you're still a teenager. What the hell are you talking about? The spring of life when the world seemed so beautiful. That was like three years ago. Y you need to catch a grip. Oh God, why does the mind and the heart age so quickly? Why are people not trustworthy? Where did the fiery faith go? I do not know what she's on about here, but I, th I feel like it was another one of her dramatic moments because not too long after she's like, a year ago, I wrote that I'm curious what I would be doing the year after. Here is what a difference a year makes. And this is, this is some tea, by the way, because she never mentions her crushes. She never mentions anything regarding her love life. She only mentions once when, like, which month and which year she fell in love for the first time. And this is the only other moment where she's actually talking about it. And she says, last year I loved Eugeniusz, a 30-something man, by the way, who did not love me back. <laughs> Girl, I mean, you were like 18 or 17 and he was 30-something. I had no prospects of getting married, despite maybe desiring it. I wanted to stay in Lvov. I didn't feel like studying or reading, but I enjoyed learning vain skills like singing. Today, meaning like a year later, I love Osho, who is 40-something. And I know he fancied me, but I can't expect him to love me back because undoubtedly his heart has turned into stone already. So this is the thing that she mentions a lot. She had this theory that a man had his first love, got disappointed, and then his heart was just turning to stone. He could never fall in love as much again. And she said that it's tragic because girls fall in love later and by that time, the man is already super indifferent. 
So this is what she's talking about here. She thinks that since he's 40 something, he just cannot love anymore. There are prospects of me getting married, but I do not desire it as much anymore. I hate Lvov. I am the happiest when I am in the countryside. I spend my days on education and teaching. Now compare the two, so much time between those two attitudes. Who knows what I'll be thinking next year. Here comes the spicy part and this is the part where I needed to crack a code. So she wrote this sentence and a couple of words in the sentence are, are written using Cyrillic alphabet, but they're Polish words. Luckily for me, I know the Cyrillic alphabet, the basics of it. So I read most of the words and they made sense. She was talking about getting married, but one word I could not decipher for the life of me and it just didn't make sense. Whatever I came up with, it didn't make sense with the rest of the sentence. So I, I took to my Instagram and I asked people, does anyone know the Cyrillic alphabet? And it's also like the old one because it's 1840s. And does anyone know what she was trying to say here? Because obviously it's not a Russian word. It's a Polish word that's written phonetically in the Cyrillic alphabet. So it's double or triple more difficult. And we debated for a long time, a lot of people weighed in, and finally uh, Natalia came up with a solution, which is she censored this sentence because what she's saying is, in fairness, I need to add that last year, I would never have wished to have, and then the mysterious word is, children having been married. I wish for it today, but next year, who knows? So that makes sense because children was directly related to the way that children are made, which is taboo, which is probably something that she would have censored. So that makes sense. She censored the word children. She censored the words having been married. And this is interesting because I... Loki didn't expect a woman in 1840s to have opinions on whether or not she wishes to have children. Like, I just assumed they all thought it's something that needs to happen anyway. And here she's like, last year I didn't want to have children, this year I kind of do, but who knows what was going to happen next year. And it gives her a lot more autonomy than I expected. Like, I don't know how much control she had over it, actually. Well, I think she actually had children, so probably not much. But just someone having such a strong opinion on something like this is very interesting. So anyway, moving on to... <laughs> To the last section, which is her beef with Otilka. I did mention that she has an ex-friend, Otilka, and there is a whole section of the diary that is bitching about Otilka because... Okay, tell me if she was right or wrong, but... So there are some parts of the diary missing. I don't know what she wrote before this, but it starts with... Is this all an illusion? She receives those sweet letters ensuring her of my friendship with such indifference. The letters which, with the slightest change in our relation, turn into the most indifferent expressions and often end with silence. I mean, I guess she just stopped writing. This is a good example. In 1845, we met with the Malinovs household for the first time and above all of them, I liked the polite Miss Otilka best. A reminder, 1845, she was, what, 15? And when I left Dulvov, we promised to write each other. This we honored and I didn't hesitate to write my new friend back as she was writing me regularly every two weeks to remind me of her friendship. I was excited to see Otilka, who I've grown to truly love, for Easter. I asked my mom to keep in their company daily. During that week I spent in Lvov, we sometimes went on walks twice a day with Miss Yulia Malinowska, so I'm assuming her, her sister, who always would give us oranges during the walk. When I thought me and Otilka shared an equally honest friendship, I suggested we could do like Anielka Szczepańska did with Wiktia. Wiktia is her uh, older sister. Or younger? I don't remember. But like there's a year difference between them. I suggested we could do like Anielka Szczepańska did with Wiktia and swap rings. And we exchanged rings in Ostrovczyk on 7th of January 1846 when we visited them with my uncle and a big company. And I have to add that we promised each other to wear the rings always. But what changes occurred? What doubts of such a treasured friendship? I will be honest, it hurt 
to never see my ring on Otilka's finger. The ring which she initially wore without veil. Then the letters became less frequent and more indifferent, which surprised me. And then, a year after these signs of indifference, beloved Otilka, always so polite, informs me very rudely that she did an exchange of rings, similar to the one we did last year, with Helena. A reminder that Helena is the one bitch that Selena hates. <laughs> This was the moment I clearly saw the play that made me blind and made me sure of Otilka's true love, when she now tried to convince me she was just as much friends with the stupid and scatterbrained Helena. Even more mad, when I found out that beloved Otilka, I love how she's referring to Otilka as beloved every single time she mentions her and it's getting more and more salty. Even more mad, when I found out that beloved Otilka was pretending to be my friend as long as they were hoping that Hilarek, her brother, will court her. And when that hope was gone, so went the pointless love. Those are 19th century friends. <laughs> And almost all of them are like this. Only Anielka truly loved us, but I do not want to enjoy this happy thought of having one selfless love in life, because this one could fail us too. So, long story short, um, Otilka played her. She's a double-sided, double-faced snake, and she was also trying to get with her brother. I love how she says, those are 19th century friends, because... This is the first time I'm seeing someone referring to 19th century the way we do to 21st century. You know how we say, oh, this is 21st century dating, or this is what 21st century cities look like. And she's like, those are 19th century friends. Like, this is what I have to deal with in this modern 19th century. <laughs> and it's so funny. So all in all, there is a lot more to this diary, obviously. I only picked um, some of the pages that I read and found interesting. I didn't read the whole thing, but to be honest, it's, it's hard work to decipher what she was trying to write and then also translate it to English. So fun fact, she also did a visual diary from a similar period. I think maybe it was a little earlier. She did a diary where she would just paint. So it's really cute. It's this book of self-made paintings of her friends, of uh, people that she was surrounded with, of different households, of different balls, activities, etc. Like there is a painting of her first ball, first public ball. Super cute. Super cute. And not gonna lie, I'm really grateful to people that documented their boring daily lives because... This is where the juice is at. This is what this podcast is all about. We want that juice, baby. Yep, that's it. Uh, just a reminder that this was Celina Dominikowska's diary from 1848 to 1849. That's it for today and thank you for listening. 